and glory that you deserve. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. several weeks, we have been working our way one question at a time through the New City Catechism, which our children are working on in their Sunday school classes. So please respond to today's question, which asks, will God allow our disobedience and idolatry to go unpunished? No, no. God, God is righteously angry with our sins and will punish them both in this life and in the life to come, sobering reminder. Please stand if you are able as we call each other to worship. I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. One generation will commend your works to another. They will tell of your mighty acts. They will speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty, and I will meditate on your wonderful works. They will tell of the power of your awesome works, and I will proclaim your great deeds. They will tell the greatness of your omnipotence, and the Lord will be the of your works. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and loving toward all he has made. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cry and saves them. The Lord watches over all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak in praise of the Lord. Let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. Please remain standing for our hymn of praise. Give to God our immortal praise.
seated. Let's confess our sins to the Lord first by reading in unison from the order of worship and then having a moment of silence. O most holy God, we confess today how difficult it is to tame our tongues. Your word tells us that the tongue is a fire and we know that it's true. We say things we should not say, words that tear down instead of build up, phrases that divide rather than unite. We remain silent when we should speak, and we speak when we should be listening. Our mouths can sing your praise, but too often we speak in ways that deny any faith in you at all. We confess that we are a people of unclean lips and unclean hearts. Restore us to us this day, the joy of our salvation. Speak to us words of hope, words of healing, and enter into our lives anew. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Romans 10, 9 to 10 says, If we declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Hear and believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. At this point in our worship, we take time to acknowledge the giving of our tithes and offerings to the Lord and his kingdom. Your order of worship outlines the various ways you can do that, and there is that code online if you prefer to do it that way, according to what works best for you. Thank you for your generous support. Now please pray with me. Our Lord and Savior, we gratefully acknowledge all that you have given us including the privilege of adoption into your family, citizenship in your kingdom, everlasting life with you, the forgiveness of all our sins, the fellowship we enjoy with you as well as with each other, and so much more. You have been so generous with us. Help us to be generous with you and your servants. Bless our tithes and offerings and use them to, sp to spread the gospel, increase your kingdom, and meet the needs of your people, both here and around the world. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
youth and children in the grades K through fifth grade may go to your Sunday schools. Please pray with me. Almighty God and Heavenly Lord, how good it is to come together into your court to worship, praise, and thank you together as members of your family and citizens of your kingdom. You have promised that where two or three come together and agree about anything we ask for in your name, you will be with us, and it will be done for us. So knowing that you are with us and you are faithful to keep all your promises, we come together this morning to pray for the concerns on our hearts. First of all, we pray for the needs of our own congregation, our spiritual family here on earth. So many among us have recently suffered the death of a loved one, and we mourn with them in their loss, including most recently Miji working in the loss of her husband, Ken, and Greta Fairchild in the loss of her husband, Dick. We ask that you would take them and those others who have lost their loved ones by the hand as they walk through the dark valley of their grief and hold them close to your heart so that they will know the deep comfort and peace to be found in your infinite love. Bring brothers and sisters alongside them to be your hands and feet to help them as they adjust to their life without their loved one. We also pray for those who are ill, either with the COVID virus or other physical infirmities, that you would bring healing where possible and peace and courage where healing is not going to happen. For those who are isolated and feeling lonely, bring a renewed sense of your presence and prompt others to reach out to them with love and care. We also pray for healing of broken relationships. Lord, may you comfort those. We also ask that you would keep safe our extended family members who are out on the front lines serving in foreign lands in your name, the Baltimas, the Callisons, the Ospies, and our Mexico mission partners. Help them to be strong and fruitful as they share the gospel where it can be dangerous to be known as your people. We also pray for those who are serving in your name who are closer to home, the Warners and Alex Smith. May their ministries also flourish and bring glory to your name. We pray for our church staff, especially for pastors Tom and Lori as they lead us. Fill them with your spirit that they may know your will for our congregation and guide us accordingly. Especially empower Tom as he brings the message you have given him to share with us this morning. Open our minds and hearts to listen carefully for what you want each of us to learn and obey today and in the days to come. We pray as well for Mary Ann, Matthew, and Brad that you would bless their ministry among us. Give us opportunities to affirm and thank them for their service. We are grateful too for the faithful service of our deacons. Continue to inspire and strengthen them as they care for the needs of our congregation. And thank you for our elders on session. Fill them with your wisdom and a deep awareness of your will for us as they lead us. Help us all to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with you according to your word. Finally, Father, we pray for our nation and our world. There is so much that is going wrong, so much suffering and so much darkness that we find it hard to know what to pray. But we do ask for peace, especially in the Ukraine. Cause all involved to step back from the brink of war and to seek reconciliation instead. We pray for our leaders that you would give them wisdom and common sense and the desire to do what is good and right in your eyes. Shine the light of your glory into the dark places where people are acting corruptly so that they may be held accountable and empower your people to be your ambassadors, salt and light, people who are bold to share the gospel wherever you have planted us. We also ask that you would cause the virus to burn itself out. Help those who work in healthcare to find renewed strength and commitment as they care for the ill. Above all, Lord, may your kingdom come and your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. In all these things, may you be glorified. As the psalmist said, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, 
our rock, and our redeemer. In the name of our precious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Please stand for the singing of our hymn of preparation, Speak, O Lord. fortunate to have a little slice of sunshine right now, then enjoy it or move away from it, your choice. If you'd like sunshine, go ahead and track that down. Those of you at home, just stay comfortable on your couch. You're good. Father God, may these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. James continues to give us a vivid and practical look at real Christian faith lived out in the world. Authored by the half-brother of Jesus, he has a few things to say. As the leader of the early church in Jerusalem, he has a pastor's heart. James provides rich insights into many, many practical issues facing Christians today as we live out our Christian faith in a post-Christian world. James gives us a renewed sense of the depth of our sinfulness and the sufficiency of Jesus. James helps us discover what it looks like to put real faith into action in real life as we grow in our love for God and for each other. So the dominant theme of James is genuine Christian faith. Genuine Christian faith. What does that look like? In James 1, we saw that genuine Christian faith means loving people in, with our words and our actions, especially those who are most vulnerable. 
We hear God's word, and then we do God's word, and we care for the widows and the orphans and the vulnerable, those who can't help themselves. In James 2, we learn that genuine Christian faith jumps into action and loves everyone without favoritism. God calls us to care for, welcome, and receive everyone without showing favoritism. So genuine Christian faith involves more than just believing. It involves obeying and acting. Now in James 3, we revisit the importance of our words as we live out our genuine Christian faith in this world. If you remember back in James chapter 1, verse 19, in James chapter 1, verse 26, we were warned by James to keep a tight rein on our tongues. Now in James 3, he turns once again to warnings about the small and mighty tongue. Words are powerful. Yesterday I was filling up my car at the Shell station on Upper State, and It's an old car with a license plate that you pull down, and you have to pretty much be on your knees to get the gas pump into there. I think they've done a lot in 50-so years in how to fill your car with gas. But I'm down on my knees behind my car, and all of a sudden, out of the gas station runs a young man, clearly disturbed, and he says, I'm sorry, and then he ran off into San Roque somewhere. And I said to the clerk who came out looking for him, I said, what happened there? He said, well, he just stole a pack of cigarettes and ran off. And I said, well, at least he said, I'm sorry. (laughs) You know, I think as we start to think about our words, we have a great temptation to just say, before we even do it, before our tongue goes crazy, we yell, I'm sorry. But we do it anyway. This is something we need to think about here. Genuine Christian faith will show itself in deeds. And James has this real strong push on how dangerous our words can be. Our words show the maturity of our Christian faith. The tongue is a small instrument with extraordinary power. For their size, words punch far above their weight. Words have the power and the potential to glorify God and build up our neighbors, but they also have the power and the potential to dishonor God and harm our neighbors. I read a study this week that said the average person will spend about one-fifth of their lives talking. I buck that average a little bit, I think. That's average. Some people talk more, some people talk less. I also read that for every five hours we speak, we produce enough words to write a 50,000-word novel. Would you want to read that novel? (laughs) Most of us don't spend five hours a day talking, but we average, they say, speak about 16,000 words a day. That's not counting texting and emails and social media and even sending those handwritten notes with stamps on them. Throughout our lives, unless we've taken a vow of silence or we're playing Little Red Schoolhouse in the car on the family road trip, we're consistently communicating. We're communicating people created by a communicating God. But here's the problem. We live in a fallen world, and sometimes our mouths can get us into trouble. One misspoken word can end a career. Just look at the news destroy a friendship, alienate us from our family, break apart a marriage, or wound deeply. We've all heard, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Anyone on the other end of a careless barrage of words knows that statement isn't true. A broken bone takes about six to eight weeks to heal. Well, the pain of cruel and misspoken words can linger for a lifetime. I've, canc- I've counseled people in their 70s, in their 50s, in their 80s, who still remember the pain of a, of a word spoken years and years and years ago. Throughout this letter, James keeps reminding us of the power of our tongue. Now in James 3, 1 to 18, he focuses on three things regarding the power of our words. First, he says words are powerful. 
Second, he says there's no way we can control our words on our own strength. And third, he says our words reveal the inner condition of our hearts. So words are powerful. We can't control our words on our own strength. And words reveal the inner condition of our hearts. So keeping with the theme of genuine Christian faith, James tackles head-on the source of a great deal of destruction, heresy, division, and pain in the Christian church. Words. A pastor from Scotland at a church that Lori and I went to once said, every sort of evil in the world finds an ally in an uncontrolled tongue. Every sort of evil in this world finds an ally in an uncontrolled tongue. Words have the power to unleash evil in the world. Words spread evil. They reinforce evil. They encourage evil. They fan evil into flame. In the ebb and flow of history's darkest moments, it's always accompanied by hateful rhetoric. Hitler's hate speeches fanned into flame the Holocaust. Genuine saving faith demonstrates itself through action, and speech is a very important action, and it's an indicator of our spiritual health. So we all know that words can do good in someone's lives. I love Proverbs 16, 24. It says, gracious words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. Proverbs 25, 11 says, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. People respond to a kind word like the flowers in Santa Barbara respond to a little bit of rain and some sunshine. I'll never forget my ninth grade teacher, Miss Bach, seeing something in me that the other teachers didn't see. And she said, Tom, I believe in you. But here in this passage, James focuses on the potential harm of our words. With an uncontrolled tongue, we can slander, we can gossip, we can belittle, we can ruin a reputation, and we can create division. James begins by singling out teachers in the church because that's where the truth and doctrine are upheld or destroyed. Teachers matter because if a teacher gets it, wrong, gets it wrong, then everyone under that teacher gets it wrong as well. So let's open our Bibles to James chapter 3, verses 1 to 2 to start with. James chapter 3, verses 1 to 2 says, Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say, is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. Now, I don't know if you've noticed this, but in the world of Google and constant connectivity with our smartphones, it feels like we're all experts in everything now, aren't we? But James is asking us to take a deep breath, to pause, and think about that for a moment. You sure about that? You sure you want to step into that? You really an expert in that? And this warning from James applies to church leadership, yes, to Sunday school teachers, yes, to school teachers, yes, to coaches, yes, to parents, yes, to mentors, to anyone teaching anyone. Each one of us should take very seriously the responsibility we have as teachers. God has given us his word and his truth, and he wants us to teach his word and truth accurately. Teaching is a high call to submit to God's truth, and teachers in that role can do a lot of harm. So James's warning to teachers is right in line with the same thing that Jesus gives us in Matthew 18, verse 4. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it'd be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the ocean. That's a really good recruiting verse for our children ministry in the early school, I think. We could hand out little millstones or necklaces with this weighty responsibility around it, right? 
I met with the early school teachers at the beginning of the year, and I read those two verses from James and Matthew. They looked at me like, what are you doing here, Tom? There is so much more to this passage in James than just being nice to everyone, though, and not cussing, as we say in Georgia. The very truth of God's Word is at stake here. That's why he starts with teachers. You know, in Ephesians 6, 14, it's the belt of truth in the armor of God which holds up and encircles all the other pieces of armor. The belt of truth. And, and Paul says it's the belt of truth, the armor of God, that allows us to be strong in the Lord and mighty in His power in this post-Christian world. Words matter because words present the truth of God's love, grace, and salvation. And those words have eternal weight. James is aware in this text, you see quickly, that we stumble in all sorts of ways. There's only one perfect human who was sinless, and they're not here this morning. Well, actually, Jesus is here this morning. Jesus was the perfect one, the only one who never said a hurtful or misleading word. James Throughout his entire book, we see that followers of Christ are on this journey towards what he calls perfection. But that word perfection, the way he uses it, is actually means more like wholeness or completeness. We strive on earth, but we never attain it in this life. But we keep striving to be whole and complete, authentic followers of Christ. We strive for this maturity, for this completeness, for this perfectness. And then in describing the perfect, hypothetical, perfect human, James says they keep their whole body in check. And that word in check in the NIV is literally to bridle in the Greek, like you would a horse. So this makes a natural transition for James as he gives a series of six vivid illustrations and practical illustrations from everyday life, highlighting the power of our small but mighty words. Look at verse 3. When we put bits in the mouths of horses, horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and driven by strong winds, they're steered by a very small rudder whenever the pilot wants it to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Like a small little bit or a small rudder, our words are small, but they're mighty. Sam Albury writes this in his commentary. He says, one of the biggest ships in the world is the U.S. aircraft carrier, the Eisenhower. It weighs over 91,000 tons. It's nearly 1,100 feet in length. It has a nuclear-powered 280,000 horsepower engine and a complement of 6,100 men and women has nearly 100 aircraft on it. It's vast. It's like a floating city. And yet all that weight, personnel, and hardware are steered by a rudder that's just a tenth of 1% of the ship's size. Something so comparatively small is able to maneuver something so huge. That's how James describes our words. Words and our tongues are from them come these words that are small, but their influence is disproportionate to their size. He further illustrates in verses 5 to 6. Look at the James 3, 5, and 6. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. You think James is fired up here? He's fired up. A positive word has the power to heal, restore, and bring life, but a negative word can destroy and cause great damage. Have you noticed in your life that it takes a lot of positive words to make an impact? But then it's just that one small negative word that can make all that positive just come tumbling down. I call that the bowling ball effect. Some people are really good at bowling turkeys all day long, and they're all around us. 
And they pride themselves in being able to put people in their place. Oh, I can put them in their place. My preaching professor, Haddon Robinson, used to say that we should give out 10 attaboys for every you jerk. 10 positive words of encourage for every word of critique. And yes, there are times when a word of critique or correction can be a blessing. Proverbs 15.31 says, Whoever heeds life-giving correction will be at home among the wise. Our words are powerful, and they have great potential to be destructive. Words are uncontrollable, as James says, and words reveal our hearts. Just like a doctor is able to look at our tongue and have us say, awe and see if we're healthy. I don't know how they do that. It's some cool thing. They teach at medical school, probably. But our words reveal the truth of what's going on deep inside of us. In Mark 7, 20 to 23, Jesus said it this way, What comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, evil, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these things come from inside and defile a person. Our tongues reveal our hearts. Now, so far, based on what James has said about the power of the tongue, you'd think that the application would be really easy for us. All we have to do is just be careful what we say, right? Let's just be careful with what we say. But there's a problem with that advice. And we see it in James 3, 7 to 12. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise our Father and Lord, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth came praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives? And a grapevine bear figs, neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. It would be great if we could all just tell our tongues, hey, be careful what you say. But unfortunately, it's not that easy. The problem is our tongues won't listen and obey. James says it would be easier to tame a wild animal than it is to tame our tongue. We can't We can get the tiger, right, at the circus to dance on top of a barrel. I've seen it before. But no human being, James says, can tame the tongue. We can get an elephant that weighs 15,000 pounds to play baseball, ride bicycles, play musical instruments, and wear a wedding dress. I googled it. But no human can tame a tongue. We bless God with our mouths, and the next minute, out of that same mouth, we're shouting curse words at our neighbor. In the South, I overheard someone like unloose this string of cuss words on someone, and the person next to him said, you kiss your mama with that mouth? (laughs) James is saying the same thing, like you kiss your mom with that same mouth? James says the way the world works is good things come from a good source and bad things come out of a bad source, so we know the root by the fruit. Eventually, what's on the inside, James says, will come out in our words and our actions, and we won't be able to keep saying good things if we don't have a good heart. We can't fake it. When something comes out of our mouths that surprises us, we should never say, where did that come from? We know exactly where it came from. Words reveal the shape of our hearts. James says our words are powerful, they're difficult to control, and they reveal our hearts. So what's on the inside will eventually come out in what we say. So what do we do about this? I suppose we could all walk out of here in awkward silence, have the most awkward coffee fellowship in all the history of El Montecito Presbyterian Church. Some of us could just take a vow of silence from this point on, 
we could just say, no, I'm going to think before I speak that word, before I send that text message or email. But we need to go deeper than just those surface measures, which are helpful. And James 3, 13 to 18 tells us we won't be able to solve this problem on our own. Remember, James 3, 8 says, no human being can tame the tongue. No amount of human wisdom, outside accountability, or self-help can solve the problem of our tongue because no human wisdom gets deep enough to touch our hearts. So even if we take a vow of silence, you're still going to harbor anger and jealousy and selfishness and greed and lies deep in our hearts, right? We don't have a, a tongue problem. We have a heart problem. And for a heart problem, we need to go to the ultimate heart surgeon. We need to lean into and pray the prayer of Psalm 51.10 with David, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. We need God's healing touch. We need God's wisdom. And that's exactly where James takes us in verses 13 to 18. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in humility that come from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but it is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere, peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. James gives us a solid description of true and false wisdom. God's wisdom, which we can't get from any earthly source, looks very different than the wisdom of this world. If we look at both lists very clearly, one stands out head and shoulders above the other, Look at the drastic contrast. Wisdom from the world brings forth bitter envy, selfish ambition, boasting, denial of the truth. But wisdom from heaven is pure, peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Which list would you like to have describe your family? Which list would you like to see in your friendships? Which list would you like in your workplace or your school? Which list would you like as a description of what we experience here in this congregation? We would all choose the relationships based in the wisdom from heaven, and wisdom from heaven only comes from God. We can only get this type of life-changing, tongue-taming, genuine Christian faith lived out in action from the wisdom of God. Augustine once said, James does not say that no one can tame the tongue, but no men can tame the tongue. So that when it is tamed, we confess that th this is brought about by the, by the pity, the help, the grace of God. I was once visiting a small Presbyterian church in a small village in Brazil. It was a remote village, and this little boy heard me speaking English. And he tugged on his mom's shirt, and he pointed at me. And in Portuguese, he asked his mom, Is his tongue broken? Yes. According to the Bible, we all have broken tongues. And we can't fix our broken tongues by healing, dealing with, we can only fix them by dealing with our heart. And we deal with our heart by asking God for a new heart. And a new heart is exactly what God promised and made possible through Jesus Christ. The eternal purposes of God for each one of us as followers of Christ is to make us more like His Son, 
If we're Christians, then God's purpose is to make us like Jesus, and that's what he is doing. That's God's eternal plan for us, to make us like his son. In 2 Corinthians 3.8, Paul says, And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is spirit. God is working to make us more like Jesus, to transform us into his image. And what were those words of Jesus like? Do you remember when Jesus was just 12 years old and his parents accidentally left him behind at the temple in Jerusalem? That's a whole different sermon on the different types of parenting styles. But I'm amazed, as I read Luke 2 a couple days ago, what I'm amazed at is the response of the seasoned, well-educated Jewish teachers sitting around the temple. And they said when they heard Jesus, they were amazed. And they listened to this 12-year-old speak words with his tongue. They said everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answer. People marveled at the words that came from the mouth of Jesus. And then at the end of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7, verse 28, when Jesus had finished saying all these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught, he spoke as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. Do you see a theme here? People were amazed at the gracious words of wisdom that came from the mouth of Jesus. They were in love with the words that came from his mouth. No one taught like Jesus. No one had the wisdom and authority, love and grace and truth that he had. And the only hope we have of building people up with our words is being born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. The only way change comes is by being transformed into the likeness of Jesus, and that only comes from above. We deal with our words by dealing with our hearts. And we deal with our heart by asking God to give us a new heart, which is exactly what he promised and made possible through Jesus Christ. We can't clean up our lives without God's grace. And through God's grace, we can begin to reflect the love and kindness of Christ in our words and our actions. And it is my prayer that we as a church, as a community, and as individuals seek after that heart transplant and let God take care of the inside so that what comes out of us is attractional and missional. And the people around this community start to say there's something different about those people. There's something about them. Yep. It's that we know that it's what is on the inside that makes a difference in how we live on the outside. So my hope and my prayer is that we would take James 3 to heart. And we would know that words are small but mighty, that they have great potential to destroy, but they also have great potential to build up. Because they reveal what's on the inside, and we need to deal with on the inside every moment of every day, not on our own strength. For no human can tame the tongue, but through God's strength. Father God, We confess that we need your help. We can't clean up our lives, our mouths, our words on our own strength, but only as we surrender our lives to you. So Lord, if there's anyone here today that does not know you, that has not confessed with their mouth that Jesus is Lord and doesn't believe in their heart that you raised your son from the dead, may they come to know you today. May today be the day that A new heart is given, that lives are transformed, surrendered to you. So, Father God, may anyone hearing my voice surrender to you, knowing that you are Lord, 
and you are good. And we pray, Lord, that you would help this community to build up one another with their words, that we would stop gossiping and slandering and saying things that don't encourage us, Lord, and build us up. May we not be a community surrendered, Father God, to ourselves, but surrendered to you. And we pray that this would happen not by our own strength, but by your strength. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Please stand now as we sing with our mouths, Living Hope. As a teacher who doesn't really want a millstone tied around my neck and 
to be thrown into the ocean. I don't want to mislead you guys. I never want to do that. And so here at El Montecito Presbyterian Church, you hired pastors, you have elders, you have deacons who are committed to upholding the authority of God's Word. So the sermons will be grounded in Scripture. What we say will be grounded in Scripture. And I want to give you a little homework as your teacher this morning to read Isaiah chapter 6 this afternoon in a quiet place. Open your Bible, open your phone app, whatever you've got, and read Isaiah chapter 6 because in there you'll see this glorious picture of the throne room of heaven. There are seraphs flying around with six wings. That it just boggles your mind, like six-winged holy creatures. They're covering their eyes and their feet with wings, and they're flying with wings, and they're encircling the throne of God, and they're proclaiming day and night, holy, holy, holy. The, the three times holy God doesn't get any more holy than that. It's the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. And then at the sound of their voices, the temple shook and it was filled with smoke. And Isaiah calls out to God, Woe to me, I am a ruined man because I have unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Almighty. And then those seraphs flew over to the altar and they took a hot burning coal from the altar and they brought it over to Isaiah's mouth and they touched it to his lips and said, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And then Isaiah heard a voice from the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And Isaiah said, here am I. I send me. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of Jesus Christ, giving thanks to the Father through Him. Go and love the Lord in word and deed.